But thank you all so much for joining us for the history of Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom. Disney World's Animal Kingdom is the largest addition to the Florida parks. Walt Disney wanted to use live animals on the Jungle Cruise at Magic Kingdom, but that was impractical. So Animal Kingdom allowed uh, the company to realize Walt's vision for live animal attractions. Today, we're gonna learn about the obstacles faced with uh, building a theme park and zoo and discover what there is to see at the wildest of the Disney parks. And this presentation, uh, 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 so by the way, the presentation is the history of Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom. I don't know if I missed that part or not. Uh, so today, today's presentation is led by Valerie uh, Gugala, who's a history presenter and lecturer specializing in Abraham and Mary Lincoln, presidential history, the Victorian era, and all things Disney. Valerie is an avid Disney fan, making more than 25 trips in the past 15 years. Uh, she's a, both a Disney Vacation Club member and a D23 Club member, and she presents on the history of Disney's, Disney to libraries across the country. So all uh, nearly 60 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Valerie for joining us this afternoon. And Valerie, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. I am thrilled to be back with all of you um, and thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, Disney World. Uh, and today specifically, as Robert said, we're talking about Disney's Animal Kingdom, the newest uh, Disney theme park. And as he said, the biggest. Um, I will give you a little bit of trivia. A lot of times when you go to trivia about Disney, one of the questions they'll ask you is, which is the biggest Disney theme park? The answer is Animal Kingdom. Um, a lot of people think it's Epcot and that's not right. Animal Kingdom is bigger because of the area they need for the animals, the area they need for the safari. Um, and so that's a trivia, you can get a trivia question right with uh, that little bit of trivia. Uh, a sister question to that is which park has the biggest parking lot and that's Epcot. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, very quickly, Robert already told you that I am an avid Disney fan. I go to Disney all the time. These are just some pictures of me at Disney World. I don't think any of those were taken at Animal Kingdom, but um, that is my contact information with my website, and I can show you that again uh, later. On my website, I have some suggested reading. Uh, if you want to do some more reading about the history of Disney World, there's some suggested reading on there. And also, if you're planning on going to Disney World, there is a few resources there for that as well. Or you can always email me uh, and ask a question. I'm more than happy to try to answer a question for you. All right. so. Uh, this is Disney's MGM Studios, and you might say, well, this is about Animal Kingdom. Why are we starting there? And we have to back up uh, before we start talking about Animal Kingdom to talk about MGM just slightly to say that um, when Disney's MGM Studios, or as it's now known, Hollywood Studios, opened in 1989, it was an overwhelming success. Uh, the CEO at the time was Michael Eisner, and he wanted to announce that the 1990s would be the Disney decade and would include new themed entertainment venues and attractions, including a new theme park. Uh, universe, uh, this Hollywood Studios had been built in response to Universal announcing that they plan to build a theme park in Central Florida. Um, and Michael Eisner was enthusiastic about a Walt Disney World theme park that would emphasize live animals like Bush Gardens in Tampa and would also include roller coasters. By 1990, a small team of about seven to eight Imagineers were hard at work in a trailer with three by five cards and artist sketch pads to try to figure out something that would meet Eisner's criteria, but was Disney oriented. Uh, one of the advantages to this proposal was that Walt Disney himself was a lover of animals, and he was a strong advocate for conservation throughout his entire life. So let's talk a little bit about Walt and live animals, his history with them. So Walt's addition, uh, original plan, as Robert said, for the Jungle Cruise uh, at Disneyland was that the ride would feature real animals. But they quickly realized that that was going to be very impractical. Uh, there was limited space at Disneyland for the animals if they were going to have live animals. Uh, they would have needed much more space. 
And also no one in the Disney company had any experience handling and maintaining live animals in their habitats. And Disneyland was going already way over budget. Uh, the construction costs totaled at $17 million, which would be about $131 million today. And the cost of adding the proper care for live animals would have been way too much to add at that time. Um, not to mention that you can't count on wild animals being where you want them to be as these animatronics in these pictures always are. So instead of including the wild animals at Disneyland, Walt decided he would share the stories of live animals through his true life adventure films. Uh, they were a series of nature documentaries that uh, debuted throughout the 50s, and eight of the films even won Academy Awards. Uh, the True Life Adventure series uh, were full-length films. There was one called The Living Desert. You can see the poster for it there in the middle. That came out in November of 1953, and it was the first full-length of the True Life Adventure documentaries. Uh, it won Best Documentary Feature in 1953 and was the highest grossing film of all time in Japan. Uh, Vanishing Prairie was another one, and it won the Best Oscar for Documentary in 1954. African Lion uh, from 1955 was shot in Kenya. Secrets of Life in 1956 uh, followed the changing world of nature. And White Wilderness from 1958 was filmed in Canada, and it won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature in 1958. Um, this is a movie that is a little bit controversial and probably really isn't shown anymore. Um, this is uh, the documentary that contained the scene uh, that supposedly depicts mass lemming migration and ended with the lemmings leaping into the Arctic Ocean. You may have heard about this. Uh, in 1982, a Canadian television news magazine broadcast a documentary about animal cruelty in Hollywood, and they focused on this movie, White Wilderness, and they discovered that the lemming scene was filmed near downtown Calgary and not in the Arctic Ocean as implied. And a lemming expert claimed that the particular species of lemming shown in the film is not known to migrate, much less commit mass suicide. So uh, that is kind of a black eye for the Disney Corporation um, in this. But in addition to the True Life Adventure series, Walt and the studio were known for bringing live animals into their animation offices so that the animators could draw their own versions of these animals based in reality. Uh, they had great attention to deal with this. Uh, as you can see, there's Walt with a deer uh, around the time they were making Bambi, uh, another animator with some Dalmatian puppies for 101 Dalmatians. So they did this and they still do this to this day when they're animating animals. Uh, the Jungle Cruise may have eventually opted for jokes from the skippers and audio mechanic animals, uh, but animals have always been a part of the Disney parks. Horses, for instance, have been mainstays at the Magic Kingdom since the Magic Kingdom opened. They're used for parades and other events. The Living Seas at Epcot was the first major expansion of a Disney theme park that focused on the care and conservation of live animals. Uh, the Living Seas Pavilion was a huge achievement for the company in terms of caring for animals in a theme park environment. So um, at the Living Seas at Epcot, you can see a wide variety of fish, sharks, sea turtles, dolphins, other ocean life, while learning more about these animals from Disney cast members. Uh, the CEO of Walt Disney, Michael Eisner, at this time was kind of known for wanting to one-up the competition. Uh, now, while this was not his primary reason for pushing forward with Animal Kingdom, uh, the park did come to be following a little bit of Eisner's usual process of taking an idea from another company and making it Disney's own, just like with Disney's MGM Studios versus Universal Studios. Um, Eisner looked to Bush Gardens in Tampa, uh, and it was um, had Bush Gardens has greatly expanded since it first opened in 1959. Uh, in 1959, it was just a landscape garden promoting beer. 
Bush beer. And since then, they had expanded to include the Serengeti Plains in 1965. And so Eisner saw Bush Gardens Tampa as offering something that Disney World did not. And he felt it was stealing potential guests and revenue. So in the late 80s and early 90s, Eisner sent Disney Imagineers, including this gentleman here, Joe Rohde, who ends up being kind of the godfather of Animal Kingdom. Um, he sent them to visit zoos around the United States to learn about how they could create a park with animals. Uh, the Imagineers came back and they had came to the conclusion that pretty much every large city had a zoo and that they were generally affordable educational experiences that could be seen in a couple hours or less. They were usually funded by grants or partially by the cities themselves, and families could visit multiple times with free days, library passes, or similar experiences at Disney, um, other than Disney prices. Um, so it seemed kind of crazy that people would want to pay Disney prices to come to basically a zoo. And that's what the Imagineers uh, told um, Michael Eisner. So, whoops, moving on. Come in. There we go. So um, the brainstorming sessions about Animal Kingdom pushed Imagineers to work towards a concept that would set Animal Kingdom apart from city zoos. Because after all, why would anyone spend those prices, like I said, to experience something that they could just see at home? And I have to admit that when uh, my family and I first started going to Disney World, we kind of had this um, same thought. Um, I live in the Chicago suburbs, and there are two world-class zoos in the Chicago area, Brookfield Zoo and uh, the zoo downtown, the Chicago Zoo. Um, and we just thought, why, why would we go and pay that? for a day to see animals. Um, but Animal Kingdom is much more than animals. Um, so the Imagineers looked back at Bush Gardens that they offered beautiful lush landscapes along with roller coasters. Um, but Disney Imagineers agreed that just adding a park with animals and a couple of roller coasters wouldn't be enough. The original Disney spin on a zoo or animal park brought up earlier concepts for Epcot, where different areas of the park would convey totally different educational experiences for guests. Uh, for Animal Kingdom, designers originally thought of the experience as one part animal exhibit, one part rides, and one part educational opportunities. And the end product when we visit the park today is actually a combination of those three areas. Uh, Michael Eisner, along with Roy Disney, who you see there on the right, um, and Michael Eisner is on the left, uh, they announced the park formally in 1995 with a media event at the Contemporary Resort that showed glimpses of what would be expected at the park, including images of dinosaurs, safari vehicles, and a mock-up of the Tree of Life, which we'll talk about the Tree of Life in uh, great detail in just a couple of minutes. Uh, the media fact sheet said that the park would be five times the size of the Magic Kingdom. Uh, actually, eventually, um, you can fit the entire Magic Kingdom in just the area that is taken up by uh, Kilimanjaro Safaris. A little bit of trivia. Um, they said that the park would feature upwards of a thousand animals, many of them endangered and supported by Disney's conservation programs. So according to Joe Rohde, who is on the left here, uh, Dick Nunes, who is on the right, is another reason that Disney's Animal Kingdom came to be. Um, at the time, Dick Nunes was chairman of the Walt Disney Attractions, and he was an opponent of the project because he thought it was just a zoo. Uh, Joe Rohde said, I called him and arranged to fly to Florida and present the one-page idea for the park. I set up my boards and did my presentation, and Nunes said, well, you've addressed all my concerns. This isn't what I thought it was. It's new, and it's great. You have my support 100%, and he did. And Joe Rohde said, make no mistake, without Dick Nunes' support, nobody would have given us the time of day. 
So Joe Rohde's original proposal was for the park to be the three-part experience, uh, uh, traditional theme park attractions, a zoo-like component, and a large Epcot-style pavilion that would provide information and education about animals. Imagineers knew little about what it would take to obtain, care, and exhibit animals, so Joe Rohde brought in Dr. Bill Conway. He was a respected executive director of the Bronx Zoo, and he was brought in to educate the Imagineers. Um, the Imagineers said this was a very eye-opening education, um, but unfortunately, after a few visits to the Imagineers, uh, Dr. Conway needed to spend more time at his zoo, so he recommended the Imagineers contact Rick Barangay at the San Diego Zoo, who had recently been promoted to curator of mammals and was a trained zoologist. And this is Rick underneath the tree of life. And um, Rick argued that more animal experts were needed to make the kind of decisions being made. Um, a few more animal experts were brought on board. And Joe Rohde is now part of this discussion, whether this animal can be in the same space with this animal or how many you can fit in a hippo pond and things like that. Uh, among the peers in the zoo world, there were two opinions, that Rick was crazy for getting involved with this project with Disney or that Rick is the luckiest guy on earth to do a project with Disney. In uh, 1997, Rick hired many of the key managers as well as some of the keepers. And Rick was able to obtain some of the best professionals in the zoo industry from about 70 zoos across the country. This is Animal Kingdom under construction. Um, now looking at this picture, the Tree of Life is right here. Um, it's a little hard to see. And so this right here is the entrance plaza. So the parking lot would be out of the picture towards the bottom here. And then the safari area is way up here in the top of the picture, just to give you some wayfinding here. This is another picture of Animal Kingdom under construction uh, from another angle. This is the Tree of Life right here. At the bottom here, this white building is Theater in the Wild, where they now do the uh, Finding Nemo show. These are some pictures of the entrance area of the park under construction with the Tree of Life in the background, which we'll talk about the construction of the Tree of Life. Just a few other construction pictures. So the dedication ceremony for Animal Kingdom uh, was held on April 22nd, 1998. Now the other three parks had had their dedication held on October 1st, but Animal Kingdom held theirs on a different day because April 22nd is Earth Day. Michael Eisner said, whatever doubts we may once have had about Animal Kingdom's viability were answered on April 22nd, the day the park opened. The crowds were so large that we were forced to close our gates to further guests by 9 a.m. In a way, the Animal Kingdom takes us full circle. 30 years ago, all you could find on our Orlando property were vast herds of grazing animals and some rather intimidating reptiles. Today, after billions of dollars of, in investment, we have unveiled our most original theme park concept yet, vast herds of grazing animals and some rather intimidating reptiles. So just like every Disney park, there's a dedication stone. At Animal Kingdom, it's a simple stone and it's engraved with um, Michael Eisner's dedication. And it's found in the oasis area of the park just past the turnstiles. Uh, so this is what it says. It says, welcome to a kingdom of animals, real, ancient, and imagined. A kingdom ruled by lions, dinosaurs, and dragons. A kingdom of balance, harmony, and survival a kingdom we enter to share in the wonder, gaze at the beauty, thrill at the drama, and learn. Dedicated this 22nd day of April, 1998, Michael D. Eisner. This is a map of the park when it first opened. Uh, we have the entrance area and the oasis leading into the Tree of Life and the Safari Village. Uh, we have over here, Harambe Village, and way over here on the left upper corner is Kilimanjaro Safaris. Uh, we have Dino Land USA on the bottom right, and Asia was not open yet. 
uh, and the conservation station that you can only reach by taking a train. So let's talk about some of the areas of the park. The entrance plaza. This is an original concept for the entrance plaza. It obviously was never built. I'm sorry, it's a little fuzzy. Some of these pictures are a little fuzzy uh, when they're blown up big, but I hope it's, uh, I hope you can still see it. Um, this is another unrealized concept for the entrance of Animal Kingdom. This one was by Joe Rohde himself. It was Noah's Ark that you would enter through. I'm kind of glad they never built that one. I don't, I'm not a fan of it, but that's me. And this is what the entrance looks like today. Uh, this is what they built. After the entrance, you go into the Oasis. The Oasis uh, is the area of Disney's Animal Kingdom right after you enter the park through the turnstiles. Uh, as you enter the park, you're first greeted with lush, beautiful surroundings of the Oasis exhibits and the animals that inhabit this area. Now, many guests just breeze right through this area and don't even realize that there's animals and wildlife to learn about and explore because they're in a hurry to get to all the big attractions. Um, there aren't just animals to see, there's beautiful elements to enjoy. It's trying to show you that you're being transported to a remote area where you can explore. There's waterfalls, rope bridges, and even rock caves for you to explore. And there's various different paths that you can take through the oasis. These are just a few of the animals that you would find in the oasis. Uh, there's black swans, flamingos, giant anteaters, a boar, uh, barking deer, wallabies, and spoonbills. After the oasis, you come to Discovery Island. This is an early concept for Discovery Island. And here is another rendering of Discovery Island, very early because this is when it was called Genesis Gardens. And here is another concept of the Tree of Life. I don't know that this was ever a concept that they were considering building, but it is some artwork showing the Tree of Life with all the different animals around it. And another concept for the area uh, done by Jerry Dunn and Joe Rohde. This is a Walt Disney World Imagineer working on a model of the Tree of Life that is the central focus of this area. And another model of Discovery Island with the Tree of Life prominent there. So let's talk about the Tree of Life. When the Imagineers began thinking about Disney's Animal Kingdom, they knew this park would need an icon to represent it. Now, what would that be? Now, the other parks we've talked about, of course, the Magic Kingdom icon is Cinderella Castle. Um, Epcot's icon is Spaceship Earth. And Hollywood Studios icon has changed over the years. If you remember, we said the only thing constant about Hollywood Studios is change. But currently, they're using um, the Hollywood Hotel or Tower of Terror as the icon for Hollywood Studios. So this, the Tree of Life, is the icon for Animal Kingdom. Uh, this gigantic tree would represent the abundant plant life of the planet and the many creatures that would be carved into the bark would symbolize the vast array of animals that call Earth home. Now, early designs for the tree called for it to be about 50 feet high and that it would act as a playground for children. Um, as the ideas for the tree began to evolve and grow, a viewing platform was envisioned within its branches where guests could look over the Safari Village, which is now called Discovery Island. But then they changed their mind again. Uh, they came up with a plan to put a restaurant beneath the tree and call it the Roots Restaurant. But this idea was abandoned in favor of a theatrical show. But there was a problem with that. Placing a restaurant or a theater beneath such a large structure would create engineering problems. Uh, the tree needed to be able to withstand hurricane force winds and a large room built underneath the uh, trunk would make constructing a proper foundation very difficult. So the idea for the tree of life came to a standstill until they could come up with a solution. 
The answer to the problem came from one of the Imagineers who happened to be at home watching a television program about offshore drilling. Uh, he saw the type of structure that's used for that, and he immediately knew that the tree of life could be moved forward. Uh, the free span oil drink, drilling platform offered a wide base large enough to house a good sized room, a narrow center section for the tree's trunk, and an expanding top section capable of supporting branches. Uh, after they did some preliminary studies, a drilling platform was purchased and shipped to Tampa, and from there it was trucked to the Animal Kingdom and erected on site. And this is a model of that structure. The next problem that they had to tackle would be the branches. In order to withstand winds up to 75, 74 miles an hour, uh, the limbs would need to be made out of a rigid non-flexible material, they thought, like steel. Um, and in addition, in order to make the project cost effective, the branches would have to be mass produced. Um, but the problem is that uniformity is not something that really occurs in nature. Um, and so they had a problem with that. And any renderings they did of the Tree of Life, uh, as you see here on the left, it resembles a geodesic dome more than a tree. So to solve these problems, the engineers developed a flexible injection molded fiberglass to create the branches. Um, they, they would range in size from two feet in circumference at the trunk to two inches where the leaves would attach at the end. And since the material was flexible, it would move in the wind like a real tree. Um, this is a picture of very early construction on the Tree of Life. You can see it's just the bare oil drilling rig. And here is another picture getting further along. They're starting to add a branch at the top. Um, they needed a way to attach the branches in a random pattern. Uh, and to resolve this, 32 balls were created and secured to the tree. And then from each ball, one or two secondary branches would be attached in various positions. Special expansion joints allowed the secondary limbs to move when a breeze passed through. And from these branches, smaller uh, territory boughs could be attached, and they could be twisted and turned to create natu natural shapes. Uh, in some cases, branches would be omitted from a standard branch place that they would add them, so it would be more chaotic. Uh, when completed, the Tree of Life had 12 primary branches, 45 secondary branches, 756 territory branches, and 7,891 end branches. Uh, the tree stands 145 feet tall and is 165 feet across. These are some of the branches lined up waiting to be installed on the tree. And here they are lifting one of the branches into place. Now you notice this branch has leaves on it. So the Imagineers had to work with outside firms to develop a natural looking leaf that would withstand wind, heat, cold, and moisture. And in addition, they can't fade. Um, they have to resist the effects of ultraviolet light. So in the end, 102,583 leaves, each over a foot long, were created and attached to the tree of life. Uh, they come in five shades of green and they rustle in the wind. Here's another picture of adding branches to the tree of life. And one more picture showing adding branches. And also this here is some of the root system that is eventually added to the tree, which we see in this picture here, some of the roots already carved. So the real fascination of the tree of life is not the tree itself, but the over 320 animals that are carved into the trunk. To create this work of art, an international team of artists was assembled. Scaffolding approximately six feet wide circled the tree on multiple levels, as you can see in these pictures. Uh, this gave the artists a place to work. The animals were carved out of a special plaster-like cement that was applied at a depth of two to four inches over the first layer of concrete. And then the artists worked from the top down, and they could complete approximately a six to eight square foot area within six to seven hours that the concrete was soft enough to sculpt. And this equated to roughly one average sized animal in a day. 
Uh, so this is the completed tree of life. And now that I've told you the real story of building the tree of life, let me tell you the Disney legend. Um, it's a story for those who want to believe in the magic of the tree of life. Once upon a time, no vegetation would grow on Discovery Island. There were no trees, shrubs, no flowers, nothing. It was a barren piece of land. Then one day, a tiny ant planted a seed and made a wish. He wished for a tree to grow, a tree large enough to provide shelter for all the animals. Magically, the ant's wish came true and a tree began to grow and it kept growing until there was room beneath its limbs for all the animals from A for ants to Z for zebras. And as the tree continued to reach for the heavens, the images of all the animals that took shelter beneath its shade appeared on its trunk, roots, and branches. This is a picture of the Tree of Life at nighttime. They do a show on it called Tree of Life Awakenings. It's a projection show and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you're ever at Animal Kingdom at night and they're still doing it, which I believe they are, you should definitely try to see it. So the Tree of Life animals, we already kind of mentioned briefly um, it took a team of 10 artists and three Imagineers working full time for 12 months to complete the carvings. In all, the Tree of Life took over two years from the beginning of construction to its finished beauty. Here are some of the animals a little more close up that are on the Tree of Life. It's it's a great thing to do when you're at Animal Kingdom to walk around the Tree of Life, around the base, and see how many different animals you can spot. There's the ant that's in the legend. And according to Disney, there's over 300 animal sculptures on the tree. Now, under the Tree of Life... Um, as I said, originally they thought they would put a restaurant there, but then they decided, no, they would put a show there. These are two concepts for shows that could have gone under the tree. Uh, the first was a Wonders of Nature show that's on the bottom right. And on the top left was a concept for a Lion King character show. Michael Eisner suggested a tie-in with the upcoming Pixar film, A Bug's Life, and the creative team developed a story based around the characters from that film. Uh, it's a nine minute long 3D film. Uh, it uses theater lighting, 3D filming techniques, audio animatronics, and special effects. Flick, the ant from A Bug's Life, hosts the show and educates the audience on why bugs should be considered friends. And it was the first Pixar attraction to open in a Disney park. Uh, this attraction was an opening day attraction at Animal Kingdom, despite the fact that the movie had not opened in theaters yet. Uh, the attraction opened seven months before the actual movie debuted in theaters. This is the interior of the theater for It's Tough to Be a Bug. And you can see here on the left are the two animatronics, Flick up here in the top, and Hopper is the grasshopper animatronic. It's very large and sometimes it does scare children. These are some close-ups of those animatronics. Another area of the park is Africa. It's set in the fictional East African port of Harambe and it includes a number of animal exhibits. This is a view of Harambe, a concept for it by one of the Imagineers. And this is a concept for the Kilimanjaro Safari that is part of this area by Imagineer Ben Tripp. So Kilimanjaro Safaris is the main focus of this area. It is a safari where guests climb aboard an open-sided safari vehicle for an expedition to see numerous African animals freely roaming through the savanna. Uh, you can see giraffes, hippos, elephants, and lions. Kilimanjaro Safaris, here's another little trivia for you, is the biggest Disney park attraction in the world. And as I told you earlier, you can fit the entire Magic Kingdom in this area quite comfortably. Uh, Kilimanjaro Safaris takes up 110 acres and the Magic Kingdom is only 107 acres. And Kilimanjaro Safaris makes up 20% of the entire Animal Kingdom park. This is just a map of Kilimanjaro safaris showing the different areas where different things are. 
You start out at A here and go through the track. So the ride originally began as a two, supposed two-week safari aboard Simba 1 through the Harambe Wild Reserve in East Africa. Uh, during most of the ride, you view common African animals, elephants, giraffes, antelopes, gazelles, crocodiles, monkeys, hippos, lions, zebras, crocodiles, lots of animals. Uh, the tour guides do point out animals and provide entertainment. And in the original version, the driver was in radio contact with the reserve warden, Wilson Matua, who is flying over the reserve on his routine. And the ride would take a turn when poachers were spotted on the reserve, and it was up to Simba One and the guests to stop them. The ride originally featured a cast member in the role of a gun-toting reserve warden who would capture the poachers and Little Red, who is the baby elephant in the back of this truck here. Uh, this element of the attraction was eventually eliminated um, because during cast previews, there was a dark ending where the safari vehicle would drive past the supposed corpse um, of Little Red's mother, Big Red. Um, very, very dark for a Disney attraction, especially an attraction about animals. Um, and they decided even before this debuted to the public when it was still in cast previews, that this was way too dark and way too shocking for children. Um, and so this was scrapped and changed. They got rid of the corpse of Big Red. Uh, for a little while, they kept the uh, Little Red uh, as a happy ending that she was saved. And they didn't mention the uh, Big Red. And eventually they got rid of Little Red altogether and they scrapped the whole poacher storyline. Uh, I think that's maybe better. Now, a lot of guests that go on Kilimanjaro safaris assume that the cast members are just on board for guest safety and that the attraction runs on a track like almost all Disney attractions. Uh, this is false. The cast members go through training to get the role on Kilimanjaro safaris, and all of these custom-built GMC and Ford trucks are free roaming. Uh, the drivers are actually driving them. They are steering them, and they are controlling the speed. Uh, it's essential that this is the case because sometimes you get animals that get out in the road, and the cast members have to be able to avoid them, to stop or to swerve around them or whatever they need to do. Uh, you can see here in this picture, there is no track. It's just a free driving vehicle. And also in this picture, here's part of the um, track of Kilimanjaro safaris and there is no track for it to run on. It is free driven. These are just a few of the animals that you can see on the safari as I've already mentioned. Now you may wonder, uh, the lions at Kilimanjaro safaris are usually visible up on their rocks, as you see in this picture. Um, how does Disney do that? Well, these rocks are actually air conditioned and heated, depending on what's needed for that day. Uh, these lions originally came from Oregon, so they were used to a cooler climate. And so Disney had to install air conditioning in the rocks to keep them up there. And then also there are a few days that get a little cold in Florida, so they also and you know cats like anything heated. Uh, and so they installed heaters up there too to encourage them to stay where guests can see them. Another feature of the Harambe area of uh, Animal Kingdom is the show Festival of the Lion King. Um, this is an original interpretation of the animated film, The Lion King. It's a Broadway caliber short form stage musical and it's performed live. Um, uses song, dance, puppetry, and visual effects to create an African savanna setting filled with lions, elephants, giraffes, and birds. It was the current long run, longest running attraction at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Uh, that was until the pandemic. Uh, closed down for the pandemic when it returned, it first returned in a shortened version, uh, but just recently they've brought back the full version of Festival of the Lion King, which is really absolutely terrific. It's a great show. If you're at Animal Kingdom, you should definitely make it a must do. It did debut in 1998, and the guests set in four sections inside the theater, and the uh, action takes place in the middle of the theater. 
Uh, it's hosted by four performers dressed in costumes inspired by traditional African dress. The story of the movie is not followed, but it's replaced by a show of songs from the movie and other sources. Really a great high energy show, um, very colorful and bright and a lot of fun. And the performers are top notch. Dinoland USA is another area of the park. Um, now this part of the park is kind of in flux. Um, this coaster that you see here in this picture was just recently removed. So this is not there any longer. And the fate of the entire area of Dinoland USA is in question. Uh, Disney has not made any announcements about anything, but there are rumors that they're going to be building something else here. So we'll see what happened. Um, this is the area of the park that is home to dinosaurs and other prehistoric life. This was an early concept for Dinoland. And here's another concept for Dinoland. And one by Joe Rohde. And one by another Imagineer. Uh, this is an area of the park that is a playground for kids. It's called the Boneyard. Uh, and this actually was built somewhat like it looks here. Uh, this is a concept for the ride that was originally called, um, oh, I, well, Countdown to Extinction. <laughs> Sorry, I blinked that for a moment. Um, and is now called Dinosaur, which we're going to look at right now. Uh, this ride features a turbulent journey through the late Cretaceous period, uh, featuring prehistoric scenes populated with dinosaur audio animatronics. It opened with the park in 1998, and it was called Countdown to Extinction, as this concept art shows. Uh, and it was changed to Dinosaur in 2000 to promote Disney's animated film of the same name. But the ride um, really is pretty much the same uh, in both versions. This is the outside of the ride when it was countdown to extinction with the Triceratops out front. And now this is the outside of the ride as it looks now with the name Dinosaur. These are some concepts of the ride. Uh, well, actually the one on the left is a concept. The one on the right is a, well, sort of a photograph and kind of a concept combined. Here's an Imagineer working on one of the dinosaurs that would go into the ride. And some other Imagineers working on some of the animatronic dinosaurs. Uh, this is Hester and Chester's Dino-Rama, which is part of the dino area. This is kind of like a carnival um, that a lot of people don't like this area. They think it's stupid. The rides are small. Other people really like it. Like I said, this is the area that there's questions about its future. We'll see. Asia is another area of the park. Uh, Asia is the home to the two parks thrill rides. Um, Expedition Everest is one of them that you can see in the background of this picture. Here is the entrance into Asia. And some of the uh, theming around the area, quite really pretty theming, very immersive theming in this area of Asia. Some more of the immersive theming. This is one of the areas you can walk through in the Asia area. It's the Maharaja Jungle Trek. Uh, you can go through it and see tigers and other animals on this walk, as it says, see tigers. Uh, you can also see Komodo dragons, flying foxes, water buffalo, cranes, and macaques. But the main focus is, of course, the Sumatran tigers. Aren't they beautiful? Just gorgeous. This is their habitat that is as gorgeous as they are, in my opinion. Another thrill ride in this area is originally named Tiger Rapids Run, and then it changed its name to Kali River Rapids. It's a themed rafting expedition along a river, uh, and in keeping with Disney's Animal Kingdom's message of conservation, the attraction deals with illegal logging and habitat destruction. These are some pictures from the ride. It is a water raft ride. You will get soaked if you go on this ride. 
Uh, as you leave the dock, you begin your adventure on the river. It floats through paths of gushing geysers, past a waterfall and rock formation, and then through a dense tropical jungle. And then the water becomes choppier and you hear the sounds of chainsaws and smell smoke. Around the bend, the lush vegetation gives way to a charred tree stump and a fully loaded logging truck, which has slipped perilously into the river. And then passing through a cave, you're dampened by further dripping water and statues of water carriers, which spray water. Finally, the raft returns to the loading pagoda and riders disembark. Expedition Everest, The Legend of the Forbidden Mountain, is a roller coaster that's in the Asia area. The ride is themed around the Yeti protecting the Forbidden Mountain next to Mount Everest. So a common misconception is that this mountain here that the ride goes through is Mount Everest. It is not. It is the Forbidden Mountain. Um, I'll show you a picture where they show Mount Everest is in the background of this mountain. Uh, it's the only roller coaster at Animal Kingdom, and it's the tallest coaster at any Disney theme park. Here are some early concepts for Expedition Everest. And another concept art. This is the concept art that was chosen. And some concept art for the Yeti that is on this ride. Um, there is two times that you encounter the Yeti on this ride. One is a projection effect, and the other is an animatronic, which I will talk about and show you a picture of. Uh, this is some more concepts for the ride. And here's an Imagineer working on a model of one of the uh, ride vehicles for Expedition Everest. This is Expedition Everest being built. It took three years to build and required 38 miles of rebar, 5,000 tons of steel, and 10,000 tons of concrete. It had its grand opening in 2006. This is just a beautiful picture of Expedition Everest. Um, so this, as I said, is not Mount Everest. It's the Forbidden Mountain. Everest is represented by the barren background peak on the far right, right here. Um, it's made to seem far in the distance. Oh, far right. What am I saying? It's over here. <laughs> I don't know my right from my left. <laughs> Sorry. The Yeti. Okay, this is the largest and most complex audio animatronic figure ever built by Imagineering. The Yeti is 25 feet tall, and its movement was controlled by 19 actuators, which when they functioned in A mood in its full mode of operation, it could move five feet horizontally and 18 inches vertically. It was quite impressive when it could move. Unfortunately, after just a few months of running, the Yeti's figure framing split and it threatened catastrophic malfunction. Um, if it were to be operated any more in A mode where the arm would swing down and it would swing out, uh, it would fail completely. So since then, it's only been operated in B mode, which means it doesn't move. Uh, and they put a strobe light on it to make it seem more uh, movement. So people actually do call it Disco Yeti uh, from some, and there's even shirts that have been made up by some fans that say Disco Yeti because of that. Uh, now it's been speculated that it, the problem was caused by damage to the Yeti's concrete base, uh, which Imagineers have said they can't fix unless they take apart the entire mountain. Uh, Joe Rohde, the Imagineer who is the godfather of Animal Kingdom, said that it was his goal before he retired to get the Yeti fixed. Um, and unfortunately, he just retired this year and the Yeti was not fixed. So um, there's rumors that there were problems with the 4D uh, uh, software that built this, but nobody really knows for sure what the problem was. It's really a shame. A newer area of the park is Pandora. Uh, this was inspired by James Cameron's Avatar set. 
and um, it's based on the fictional exoplanetary moon Pandora. It has floating mountains, alien wildlife, and bioluminescent plants. It contains two attractions, Avatar Flight of Passage and Navi River Journey. Uh, this is the area of the park that Avatar Land or Pandora took up. This is the entrance plaza right here. And you can see it takes up quite a bit of area here that was mostly just backstage and cast parking before they built Pandora. Uh, development on Pandora began in 2011. Uh, construction began in 2014 and it opened to the public in 2017. Here is groundbreaking. Uh, you can see they added um, an avatar, a Navi, they're called Navi, into this picture with the Imagineers. These are the floating mountains being built. They're really quite something to see in person. And some more of the floating mountains being built. And that is the Walt Disney World Animal Kingdom cast at the opening of Pandora. Some more of the floating mountains as they look completed. As I said, they're quite stunning. This is some of the bioluminescence that you'll see at night in Pandora. If you're at Animal Kingdom, I highly recommend at least walking through Pandora at night. The pathways glow. There's lots of glowing plant life. It's really something to see. Another one of the plants. If you go up to this plant and rub this pink area here, it will shoot out spores, which is just water. Uh, one of the attractions is Navi River Journey. It is This is concept art for Navi River Journey. It is a slow boat ride through a Pandora forest. It is absolutely beautiful. A lot of people are disappointed by it because it is just a slow boat ride. Uh, there's really no thrills. It's just looking at all the different bioluminescent plants. Uh, there's projections that are quite well done. And there is this very large animatronic of a Navi, uh, the Navi Shaman, who it is an amazing animatronic, uh, very fluid movement. You would not believe that this is not an actor. It does not look like it's an animatronic. The other ride in Pandora is Flight of Passage. People, um, they compare this ride to Soren at Epcot. Uh, the difference is on this one, you're sitting on what looks like um, motorcycles or motorbikes. Uh, so it's a little bit harder for people of size to fit in this ride. Um, but the concept is you are riding on the back of what's called a banshee. You can see a banshee here and you're flying over Pandora. It's quite immersive. All right, so that is what I have to say about Animal Kingdom. So let me ask you, let's take a look at the Q&A and the chat and see if anybody has anything to say. Oh, we've got a long comment here. Uh, I attended Animal Kingdom when it first opened in the fall of 1998, and the daytime temperatures were over 90 degrees by the time the park opened. I read and heard that some of the animals perished and died in the extreme heat. Is this true? You know, I have not read that. Um, I suppose it's possible, but I have never read that. What was done to protect the other animals that they had to bring in to replace the animals that died? Um, I'm sh they'd had brought in quite a lot of um, zoologists from other zoos. So I would hope that they were able to stop that from happening. Um, all of the animals do have backstage um, housing, places that they can go, um, animal, I don't want to call them animal pens, but they're not always out on exhibit. They have places where the Imagineers and the zookeepers can take them to be out of the heat, out of the cold, out of the weather. Um, so let's see, I realize the park and animals have matured, and so have I in 22 years, but didn't the park's planners think about the fact that their park's conditions would not be conductive to animals until their planted trees and habitats would be mature enough to support the animals? I do know that they got the um, trees and habitats into the park at least a year before they brought in the animals, um, because they did know that they needed to get the trees settled and more mature before they brought in the animals. Where did the animals come from? As far as I know, they came from other zoos. 
how are they taken care of? They're taken care of by uh, Imagineers and by zoologists. Um, there is, if you have Disney Plus, there is a great series on Disney Plus uh, called Secrets of Animal Kingdom that shows you all about backstage at Animal Kingdom and all about the Imagineers and zookeepers that take care of the animals. So I would highly recommend watching that because it'll answer a lot of these questions about that. Um, I was selected to be a warthog at the Lion King show. Oh, that's fun. How long has it been open at night? Um, not that long. It was around the time that Pandora opened, which was 2017, that they really started staying open longer in the evening. I thought that wasn't safe for animals. What wasn't safe for animals? I'm not sure what you're referring to are the water features lakes rivers in the park natural or man-made uh they are man-made oh i thought oh, being open at night wasn't safe for animals um most of the animals aren't out when they're open at night they keep out some of the animals on the safari in fact they trained the some of the safari animals to be out at night and they actually have lighting on the safari um, so that it's the animals think it's more like twilight, not full night. Um, and some of the other animals aren't out at night. So they always keep in um, in their minds what's safe for the animals. In fact, uh, when they have done night shows at Animal Kingdom, they do not include fireworks in any of the night shows because that would be bad for the animals. Another thing they did, they were... Um, they used to have a show at Animal Kingdom called Rivers of Light. Uh, it included lasers and music, uh, and the music had to be kind of loud. So what they started doing six months to a year before the show is every night they would play the music for the show at the volume that it would be played when the show was running um, so that the animals could get used to that sound. And so by the time the show started, the animals were used to the sound. I'm going to bring up the slide that's got my um, email address and my um, website on it, just in case anybody wants that. I should have put it at the end, too, but I forgot to do that. Uh, let me see. Do I know if the movies like Lost Prairie are available on Disney Plus? You know, I should have checked that. I don't know. I haven't seen them myself. Um, some of them might be available. I hate to say it, but on YouTube. Um, but I know Disney is bringing more and more stuff to Disney Plus. Okay, there's the slide with my contact information. Can you explain your fancy ears? And is wearing and collecting fancy ears something that super fans do? Yeah, um, these ears are, um, I bought them because they're purple and purple is my favorite color. Um, I think they're supposed to be based on Rapunzel or um, Tangled. Um, but yes, I do have... Let's see, I have four, um, and you can see some of my other ears in this picture. Um, I have four, five, six, seven, about eight pairs of ears. And yes, collecting ears is something that super fans definitely do. Um, I like to coordinate my ears with my outfit when I'm at Disney World. I don't wear my ears except when I'm at Disney World or if I'm doing a presentation. Um, <laughs> So I don't go to the grocery store in my ears. Um, but yes, lots of super fans have lots of different pairs of ears. Um, I have a pair of ears that is themed to the Tiki Room. Um, oh, you're welcome for the presentation to everybody that's saying thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, what else do I have ears? I have the ears that you see in this picture that are just general Mickey ears. Um, I have a pair of ears that are themed to Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Um, I have a pair of ears themed to Jasmine, because my cat's name is Jasmine. So what other questions do you have? Do your travels include the Disney properties in Europe and Asia? Not yet. Oh, I was just thinking the other day, I've got to talk to my husband. I really want to go to Tokyo Disneyland. Do I meet up with other super fans? Um, yes, in the way that I have friends that are super fans. <laughs> so yeah, I meet up with them. And actually, um, my sister-in-law is a super fan. And so her and I 
uh, talk Disney all the time. We give each other Disney Christmas presents. Um, she just got back from Disneyland and she brought me some stuff from there. So um, it's nice to have another super fan in the family. What else? If you're interested in learning more about Disney World, um, on my website, I have suggestions of under planning Disney, um, suggestions of vloggers that you can watch to learn more about Disney. Um, have you been to Disneyland? Which do you like better? I haven't been to Disneyland. Isn't that terrible to say? Um, we were planning on going there this coming spring, but then our plans changed and we're going to Florida. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe in, in 2024, we can get out West. That's my hope, at least. My, da my daughter lives in Arizona, so we're planning to combine it, a trip to Arizona and then go over to L.A. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Nice, nice. So, Valerie, it looks like uh, you've gotten through all the qu substantive questions and uh, comments. Uh, so, uh, folks, look for an email from me either later today or first thing tomorrow uh, with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and um, stay tuned for uh, a couple more programs with Valerie this winter. Uh, once those are booked and finalized, I'll make sure to send you all the information. Uh, so, Valerie, any uh, last words before we wrap it up? Just thank you, everybody, for joining. It's been great to be here with you today, and I look forward to seeing you uh, this winter. All right. Thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Valerie. Bye-bye.